Hi, everybody. Happy New Year. I hope you've had a great and glorious start to the year. I can't believe that we're already into the last half of January. Uh, here in Chicago, where we're based, uh, we're having the second warmest January in history, which is really, really nice. And uh, basically no measurable snow on the ground in January, which should be our coldest month. So I hope that you're enjoying equally good weather. Uh, for our California friends on the call, I'm so sorry about what's going on over in your neck of the woods. Um, all right, let's uh, dig in and talk about debt because debt is just one of those things that I think everybody is uh, trying to deal with this time of year, one time or another. When I was publishing my personal finance books, my uh, publisher, Random House, always chose January as being the time to get that get those books published because it's really when people think about their money. They also think about their diet, and then they think about a money diet. So let's try to get away from that taxonomy and talk a little bit about the things that you can do to make your life a little more debt-free or completely debt-free. Uh, for those of you who have never attended one of our webinars, I'm the founder and CEO of Best Money Moves. Um, this is our obviously our financial wellness platform. But in addition to that, and for most of my career, I was a financial journalist. Um, I've written a number of books on money and real estate. I host radio shows. I even have a YouTube channel that has like 600 videos on it, all kinds of things, all related to personal finance. So, you know, when, as we've started this new year, right, my feeling is January is a chance to remake everything. I mean, you can remake your wellness goals, your health goals, your money goals. It's just a new opportunity. And I know that a lot of people make New Year's resolutions. And every year I recommend some things that I think home buyers, sellers, and people should do with their money. But really, it's a chance for you to be better informed, to make better decisions. And I think people should think about this being more like a spiral, as opposed to just, I don't know, jumping off a cliff, for example. Every year, you should try to just do one or two things better than you did the year before. And if you do that when it comes to your money, you're actually going to end up in a really terrific place. So money issues don't resolve themselves, right? You actually have to plan for the results that you want. And I think that people have a hard time with that, right? This idea of planning for money. I, I don't know, maybe people really do think that money goes on trees. And if they just go to Trader Joe's, like I did the other night, and they and they see a money tree and they buy it, that, that you know, the leaves will turn into dollar bills and it'll all start dropping in their lap. And all they'll have to do is go like this. But this isn't a money plan. Um, what I'm hoping to do today is share uh, some actual plans for you, especially if you've got debt, but even if you don't, that will help you make better decisions. But even if you have a plan, if you don't actually put the plan into action, uh, nothing's going to happen. So we're going to talk about that as well. I want to give you a sense of the different types of debt that people carry and how much uh, people are struggling to pay off that debt. And I think it really speaks to where we've been over the last few years and why now that interest rates have been rising, people are struggling that much more. So credit card balances and other revolving debt stand currently at about $1.03 trillion, right? So $1 trillion, $30 billion is really the number. And if you look at where the debt, uh, credit card and other revolving lines of credit are in terms of, um, you know, in terms of the height, and you'll see that, you know, it reached the very top right at the end of 2019, just before the pandemic hit, we saw this all time number, but this wasn't seasonally adjusted, right? This is just the actual dollar number. And that's not an actual accurate representation. But if you look, oop, let me go back one. If you look at this slide, you see that this is seasonally adjusted. And when you look at the amount of seasonally adjusted credit card debt and other revolving debt that's out there, what you see is that actually, and that's this is the green line, we're now at or slightly ahead of where we were 
back in 2019, um, at the end of 2019. And so uh, it's not, it's very fair to say, I should do it as a positive. It's very fair to say that we're literally all up to our necks in debt uh, because we actually are. It's just that because interest rates have been so low for so long, some of that debt it, we're doing okay with, but others like credit card debt, which rises along with other interest rates is starting to become unaffordable. So how do you compare? Uh, I think everybody always wants to know how they compare to everybody else in the world, I know I do. And in fact, we're in the process of redesigning some of the features on Best Money Moves and we're gonna have a compare button. How do I compare? But in the meantime, let's take a look at what kinds of credit card debt people are actually carrying. Um, and if you look by education, what you see is that people who have more education are typically carrying more debt, uh, which is sort of interesting. Now, they tend to make more money but they're still carrying twice as much or more than twice as much debt. Somebody with a college degree is at 7,900 on average. Somebody with a, a doesn't even have a high school diploma has 3,400 in debt. And you can see that step up. Now, when you look at all families, the typical family has about 6,200, almost 6,300 in credit card debt. And these numbers are not, they're a couple of months old, but still, I think, you know, instructive and relevant. Now, what about the average by net worth, right? And this is percentile. So if you're in the bottom 25% of uh, wealth in this country, you're carrying an average credit card debt of 4,800. Uh, if you're in the 25th to almost 50, 50th percentile, 5,200, and it steps up. And you would expect people in the top 10% of the wealth you know, in this country, they're carrying the most. But I was kind of surprised by just how much credit card debt that fi typical family is carrying, tw almost $13,000 of credit card debt. Um, if you look across the countries, uh, the main some of the main countries uh, around the world, what you see is that the US is carrying uh, more credit card debt, the average, than anyone else. So um, the average is 5,300. Again, you know, these are a little bit off from each other because it's not all done in exactly the same month. So month to month, there may be some changes and also how the population is actually counted might be a little bit different. But again, general figures, right? Canada is the next one, 4,154. People are really struggling in Canada with financial wellness. I don't know if you have any relatives or others who are there, but it's a really serious, serious problem. Um, and then you get to the UK and then Japan and then France, um, Germany. You know, it's really interesting to see that, you know, amongst most of the major countries, um, they are, by major, I mean, um, sort of most economically developed, I should say, uh, they're carrying a significant amount of credit card debt. India is interesting that it's carrying credit card debt. Credit is relatively new in India. Uh, for a long time, it was just available to people at the highest ends of the income spectrum, but that's been moving down over the years. So what about by state? Where Who's carrying the most credit card debt by state? And what you see is that Alaska is at the top with 7,700 as an amount of individual debt. Um, Connecticut, 6,800. New Jersey, 6,800. Virginia and Maryland, both in the 6,700 per uh, individual debt, which is quite significant. And, you know, just for fun, I looked this statistic up. Uh, it turns out men typically carry more credit card debt, 7,400 on average than women, 5,245. And consumers age 45 to 54 tend to carry the most credit card debt. Um, and that's not really surprising. 9,000 was a little surprising followed by those who are 35 to 44 and 55 to 64. And it, you know, I'm gonna show you a slide in just a moment, but you know, that speaks to where I think the biggest expenses that we carry really are, right? 45 to 54, you've got kids. Those kids are typically a little bit older. They're probably anywhere from, you know, eight to 10 all the way up to, you know, maybe they're in college and you're carrying, you know, some debt to manage um, how you're going to pay for those expenses, perhaps. 35 to 44, uh, that's where 
the typical uh, per family is now getting married and they're mm, sort of 33, 34, and they're having their first child and buying a first house somewhere between 34 and 36. Uh, and so that age group is, you know, really hamstrung with all kinds of expenses. And then, of course, 55 to 64, uh, you've got kids and they're still in college um, or they're just getting out of college. And now you're trying to measure and, um, and deal with some of those expenses, catch up on your retirement and things like that. All right, let's um, let's talk about student loan. I missed a slide here, sorry. So, uh, let's talk about student loan debt. So as you can see, this was the fourth quarter of um, 2021. It went up again at the end of 2022, but we don't have that number yet. But you can see that student loan debt has just been on a tear, right? It is continuing to go up. It's really not um, abating at all. It was going up during the pandemic. It was at $1.73 trillion. Uh, it's probably going to cross the $1.8 trillion threshold um, soon, if not already. And, you know, I think that this is just an enormous burden. And, and this is a deferred burden, which is why the Biden administration is working so hard to try and find ways to give people a break on their federal student loans. Um, you know, this is a, a time bomb, a ticking time bomb when it comes to debt. Nobody has had to pay a dime in their federal student loans since the pandemic started. And that was supposed to, we were supposed to start paying that off um, in, I think it was January this month. And that got pushed again until August to give the Biden administration time to figure out if there's another way to give you a break. And with things that were just announced in the last week or so, there may be a, a big break coming down the pike. So the, the new student debt repayment plan, which is called Repay, um, I'm sure there's some consultant who gets a lot of money uh, just to come up with these names. Uh, apparently, it might cut your student debt in half. So the last proposal that got hung up in court was the Biden administration was just going to forgive um, a certain amount of, of debt. Um, but now what they're looking at is a new student debt repayment plan and forgiveness plan. This apparently does not need... Uh, con congressional approval. Um, there are four other repayment programs that are out there. None of those needed congressional approval. And what the Biden administration is looking to do is literally give everybody with a federal undergraduate or graduate loan a break. And the reason they would do that is to change the nature of the income repayment uh, levels that are currently in these repayment programs. So most income is protected when you have an income repayment program for a borrower's basic needs. And what they're doing is upping that level so that uh, and reducing the amount of income, discretionary income that would be available for repayment. So this pay slide gives you some of those details that have been proposed. There are many other terms that go in it. It just wasn't, I didn't have space to put it all in here. And we're going to have to see what goes forward. But our Best Money Moves content team will be watching to see what goes on. And, uh, you know, we think that it's very likely that something of this form is going to pass and it's going to get put into action this year. Um, you can always go to studentaid.gov. If you've got student loans, somebody in your family has federal student loans and you want to see what's going on. By the way, this will be available to people who have federal undergraduate or graduate loans. Those two types of loans, though, will be treated differently in the repayment. So you'll want to make sure you understand exactly what those terms are. Now, when we look at a total debt balance for the country, um, you break it into typically housing debt and non-housing debt. Why do we do that? Well, housing debt was always considered to be good debt and non-housing debt like car loans and credit card debt were on a varying scale of not great debt. And really it, it all came down to the deductibility. You know, you could deduct, um, you know, originally back in like the seventies, you could actually deduct credit card interest and mortgage debt, uh, but now you can only do mortgage debt. And even that's been severely limited by the way the tax laws have been changed. 
So during the Trump administration, they passed the uh, SALT Act, the state and local taxes, which limits the amount that you can actually write off um, of all of your different kinds of debt. And so that um, it's, it's a little bit less that housing debt is good debt or bad debt. I, I think you should think about mortgage debt, though, as being very useful, particularly if you've got very low interest mortgage debt. So for example, uh, if you were lucky enough to get a house or refinance your house and you're paying 3% or less, that allows you to um, go out and try and find investments that'll pay more than 3%. And guess what? There are all sorts of bonds out there right now that are paying four, four and a half percent. Or if you do uh, I bonds, you're ending up with somewhere around 6.89%. And there's a 0.4% kicker in that that'll continue to follow you through the next 30 years. And so when you think about how much debt you're carrying, a useful in, uh, tool or a useful thing to do is to really sort your debt by interest rate, right? So maybe your mortgage debt is down at three or 4%. Um, where credit card rates are now jumping up and you might be paying, you know, 12, 16 or 18 percent. So thinking about how you're going to get your hands around all of your debt and how you're going to manage that, um, I think is going to have a lot to do with uh, how you go about repaying that and, and what you do with it. So let's, you know, move on to that in just a moment. Um, but delinquencies are on the rise across the board, all different kinds of debt, mortgage debt, home equity line of credit, student loan debt, auto loan, credit card debt, personal loans, other loans. It's all starting to rise. It's still extraordinarily, extraordinarily low, excuse me, tripping over my tongue. Um, but credit card debt has gone from, uh, you know, it's like 3% to now three and a third percent. Other debt has gone from 2.8% to three and a quarter percent almost. Uh, mortgage debt is still very low, again, because the vast majority of people have interest rates under 4%. And so why would you want to give that up? So they're, they're towing the line and keeping it there. And in fact, we're still a third below the delinquency rate that we were at prior to the last recession. So mortgage debt, home equity line of credit, extremely stable. Uh, it's doing well. And as long as people have jobs, it's going to be fine. And by the way, a lot of people have jobs and the, they're still switching jobs, which is showing that they feel really comfortable that they're going to find good jobs out in the marketplace. So one thing I want to just pause for a moment and talk about is how people feel when they carry debt. So I have talked in the past in some of these webinars about how carrying uh, too much debt really can keep you up at night. It can cause, uh, you know, just lack of focus, um, presenteeism uh issues it can really you know causes people to actually jump ship people look for a new job if they feel like they can actually get another quarter an hour or a dollar an hour they're going to jump ship because they imagine that that's somehow going to help them get ahead of it and it it begins to and there are studies that show this i didn't pull them but you know we we certainly have made the references to them on the website um, you know, carrying debt negatively impacts your physical and emotional wellness. Like if your goal in 2023 is to have a, a healthier existence, a holistically healthier ex existence, you know, debt is certainly not going to help that. Um, it, you know, when people carry debt, it is a, a bigger cause of or contributory cause of heart attacks, for example, particularly in men. Um, people who are financially stressed, also end up uh, with more addiction issues, right? And, and in men, particularly that plays out with alcohol. Um, they're, they're, you tend to be less concerned about your physical health. So you gain weight or maybe you're smoking more. Um, if anybody is still smoking out there. there, there's just all kinds of physical issues that come from the stress of carrying debt. And on an emotional level, right? Um, finances are the number one reason that people get divorced, right? They, they have financial issues and they can't cope with it. They don't know how to talk to each other um, and all the rest. And it causes problems. And then those, you know, raise the red flag on other issues in the relationship. 
Next month, by the way, I'm just going to throw a little plug out there. Next month, we're going to talk in our Love and Money series about how to have difficult financial conversations with people you love um, and what that looks like. So you want to watch for that. It's uh, We'll do that next month. Uh, I think it's the week of Valentine's Day. And then don't discount how um, carrying debt can also affect your credit history and credit score. And that then, it's like a waterfall, right? Your credit score goes down and then you go to get more debt and now you're paying more for the debt, whether it's a mortgage debt, car loan, credit cards. And so you pay more for that. It, it just causes issues all the way up and down. So carrying debt is not going to be your, you know, big calming centered experience. And I, you know, I'm all for meditation, but you can't meditate debt away. All you can do is really get your arms around it and start paying it down. So that's what we're going to talk about next. Oop. Oh no, I didn't do a poll. Let me, there we go. Not the way you want to start 2023. All right, so let's talk about some good news that should help. In addition to the Biden administration trying to push through some form of student debt relief, we also see that inflation is slowing. And this is going to be great news because even though prices are not dropping, right, some prices are dropping and that's great, um, other prices are not dropping, the rate of increases in prices should moderate. So that's that's the good news that I've got for you today. So let's talk about you. Let's talk about how you're managing your financial life right now and what we can do to help. So this is a what we call the life arc of money. And when I met our Best Money Moves president, Angus Carroll, 12, 13 years ago, I was trying to explain my philosophy about money. And he came back and he likes to draw everything out. And so he came back with this image. And we have used this now uh, since basically 2010. And I call it the life arc of money. So if you look down at the bottom going across, this is your age, right? 18, 22, 35, 45, whatever. Up across the left, right, are some of the um, personal finance things that you do in your life, right? You have your education and your career, you're going to, you have to live somewhere, you're going to finance things, you need to get around, you might need a car, um, insurance is a really big part of it, right? All of these things come together. And when you overlay what you need with what you can afford over age, right? What you see is this amazing bell curve of expenses, <laughs> So you start out, you're in college and things are pretty cheap. You're probably getting supported by your parents to some degree. You know, most people are, maybe you get a full ride and you're lucky um, and maybe you don't. But in any case, you're probably taking on some debt and that debt is there. And now you're in your twenties, early career. So you're getting your first apartment, your first card, your first car, you know, you're paying for a little bit of insurance. Maybe it's renter's insurance, whatever. And now you're into your 30s, and this is where you are getting, you know, partnering up and you are buying a house um, and you're, you know, now you maybe have two cars and you've got multiple credit cards and, you know, maybe you're in your mid-career years. Uh, these days, I think this orange part might actually go all the way to, you know, like you're in your, you know, 55. I'm going to probably have to revise this soon since life seems to be changing. But the point is that all of these things pile up on each other. And when you think about, you know, financial stress, what you realize is that it's never any one thing, right? One thing might be the tipping point, like debt, but everything else in your life is stuff that you actually have to do. And it's not until you're in your 40s, 50s, and 60s when you start thinking about the future and retirement and all the rest. Now that people are living to be 85, 95, 105, or like that nun who just died, 118, um, you know, these different pieces may expand. And we've time shifted a lot of this, by the way. College, which used to be, you know, three or four years, is now taking seven or eight years for people. And, you know, if you're not having your first kid until you're 35, they're not, that kid isn't going to college till you're 55, but 
younger kids may not go to college till you're 60. And so the, and they won't be done until you're in your mid sixties. And so this orange part could span three gener three decades when you're gonna really have to focus on making that work. So here's another way of looking at it where, you know, we spell out a few more of the things over here, health and wellness, travel, some of the other money things, you know, retirement, right? You've got, got in here, savings and retirement. And you, as you look at it and you realize how things go through your lifetime, you begin to realize the power and why we say to people in their 20s and 30s, listen, get a hold of this now because life is long and it's going to be much better for you if you go through that way, if you start early and plan ahead, right? But the typical budget has so many pieces. I've just shown you very high level look at it and it's hard to keep it all organized. I, I you know, hats off to people who use jars and envelopes, right? I, I don't understand the idea of managing money that way because we live in a digital society. My kids who are in their 20s, I, I don't even think they have any change. They certainly don't know what a change jar is. And when I show them mine, which was my grandmother's, their great grandmother's, they just sort of laugh at me and they're like, well, then what do you do with that whole, all that change? And how do you get change, mom? Because they don't even carry cash. So if we're going to live in a world of Zelle and Venmo um, and credit cards and debit cards, then we're going to have to find a better way of doing this. And so what we've done, obviously, Best Money Moves is give you a budget that you can use. This year, we have already begun to develop our new look and feel for Best Money Moves. Call it the 2.0 or the 3.0. I've kind of lost track. But, you know, an even better way of budgeting is coming this year uh, that is more connected uh, and requires less work for you to just be able to go in and, autom you know, connect your accounts and automatically see exactly where the spending drips are coming from. Now, what do you do if you've got too many buckets to fill and not enough income? And I think a lot of people find themselves in this position, you know, at the beginning of the year, particularly because buckets of, you know, Christmas past, the immediate past, have come to roost and you've got to go and pay some of those bills now. And sometimes there's just not enough money in January. And I have to say, for my husband and I, who were running you know, we were two self-employed people for a really, really, really long time. January was our toughest month. We had the holidays that we were coping with, and then we needed to make estimated payments for our business mid-January. If any of you have little side hustles, you know what I'm talking about because you probably are trying to make those payments right now, or you've just made them. Um, in addition to that, there's always tax bills that come in January. So in Cook County, where I live, uh, the first tax bill comes due in January, and you know, it was always a struggle for many years to figure out how we were going to, you know, get money from this account, pay this account, pay this bill. And, and really, that was very, very stressful. So there are three things you can do if you find that your buckets are overflowing, but not with money. Um, sharply reduce your spending. And we learned how to do that in the pandemic. Are you base, And we'll talk a little bit about this, but it's the go to zero plan. You can find a way to bring in extra income, right? That's always a possibility. Just find a little place to make a little side hustle. And then you can always rebalance your spending, right? So if you can't reduce your spending, then you have to look at maybe putting a little less away in your 401k while you get everything else under control. Okay. So when it comes to balancing um, and paying off your debt and saving for the future, there are two big schools of thought, right? The first thought is pay off all your debt first and then start saving. And to do that, you can either use the snowball or avalanche methods. And I'm going to walk through what those are. The second idea is to pay a little bit more than your monthly minimum in debt service and then start plowing cash into a variety of savings opportunities, 401k, Roth, Roth 401k, brokerage accounts, and emergency savings. Why do that? You end up paying a little more, but the psychic benefit of knowing that you're putting some money towards your future is really helpful for a lot of people. I like saving every last dollar I can, but I get the idea that it's encouraging if you start an emergency fund and you commit to putting, you know, $500 a month, $100 a month, 50 cents a month into it, 
at the expense of a 401k right now, that it's going to feel better to you, right? That could be a short-term fix where you're actually doing something that's going to save you from actually putting an emergency on your credit card and then spending an extra 19% on that. So I get it. These are, the, But these are the two ways, the two schools of thought that we follow along with. Now, let's talk a little bit more about the snowball strategy, right? So what is this? And you're going to hear snowball avalanche. We talk about it on our site. Lots of people talk about it. And people will tell you that one is better than the other, and they'll try and get you to pay them to do it. But we've demystified all that. You don't need to pay anybody. Snowball is the bare minimum on all but credit cards with the lowest balances, and then paying as much as you can against that one each month, right? So you take the smallest balance. So let's say you've got four credit cards and one has um, a 50, you know, ignore the interest rates, but one is $50 a month minimum, minimum you have to pay. One's 100, one's 150, one's 200, just to make it easy. So snowball means you take the $50 a month credit card bill and you plow every extra cent you can find to getting that paid off. And so if it's, let's say a $500 bill, and you're paying 50 a month, but you can find $500 in if you just ignore all the other, let's say you just don't eat out, you don't do anything for a month. Now you've got that money paid off. So you've got $50 a month. That was the minimum you were required to pay. And now you're going to tackle the next one that's $100 a month, right? So you're going to take the 50 that you were paying and the 100 that you're paying, and now you're paying 150 a month, which is going to really significantly help you pay down that next one. And then now you've got $150. When that's paid off, you're going to go and apply it to the next one. And pretty soon you're going to have all of your debt paid off. So the idea that you pay off the card with the smallest balance first and then work your way up with the second smallest balance, that's how Snowball works the best. Avalanche strategy is a little bit different. So in Avalanche, you're looking at interest rates right? So you want to pay off the highest interest rate first, putting as much money as you can against that until that one's paid off. And then you put all that cash towards the next one and the next one and the next one until all of your credit cards are paid off, your auto loan is paid off, whatever it is you're trying to pay off, right? So highest interest rate first, even if that is the most significant loan, right? The most significantly sized, you want to do that one first because that's actually, when it all comes down to it, going to save you the most money. So technically, Avalanche is always a little bit better than Snowball because of the interest that you're looking at and the number of months until the debt is paid off. Now, how do interest rates play in the payoff game, right? And this is why Avalanche works. Every dollar you prepay earns you the effective interest rate equal to the interest rate you're paying, right? So let's say your credit card has a 19% interest rate. Every dollar you pay, prepay, right? So you've got the amount you have to pay, but every extra dollar on top of that basically earns you 19% on that dollar. It's a great return. You can't get that return anywhere else, right? So it's really important. Um, question came in, what would you do would you do snowball only for credit card or for mortgages if you have multiple mortgage, uh, multiple mortgages? And the answer to that is look at your interest rates. You absolutely can do it. And I'm going to talk about this in just a few minutes um, because mortgages can be a little different. If it's a primary home or if it's an investment property, you want to treat those differently, that, that debt, because investment debt can be written off against the income you're generating, whereas your uh, primary residence or a second home, it can't be. So you're gonna wanna think about that. But yes, the same, it would all apply the exactly the same way. If you have a question, feel free to put it into the chat or the Q&A, and we will certainly uh, look at it and we'll get to all of them. And then of course, for those of you who are new, uh, we always do a, a Q and A at the very end of this, and I'll save time for that as well. Um, but in, in fact, we're almost there. So you just um, hang on for a minute, and we will uh, get there just uh, just as quickly as I can. Now, the more you prepay your debt, the faster you're going to get it all paid off, and the more money you're going to save. 
right? And of course, once you're done paying off whatever the debt is that you want to, you're going to have all this extra cash to deploy in much more interesting uh, and exciting ways. So here we are. Let's talk about um, interest rates. So if interest rates are very low, you're paying almost nothing in interest. And so the savings principle doesn't work the same way, right? So if, for example, back when I first started writing about real estate, Back in the early 90s uh, or late 80s, mortgage interest rates were around 8%. And at 8%, if you took out a $150,000 loan, you would end up paying almost three times that in interest over the course of the 30-year mortgage. But when interest rates are 3% or less, that's not happening. You're not paying that much. And so it's almost cheap enough where it's like free money. And so you might want to keep that loan once you've paid off your other debt right? Because the opportunity to earn money on the other side, the upside is much bigger. The opportunity cost um, is, is better. So what do I mean by that? If you, um, let's say your mortgage, again, your mortgage is 3%, but you can go and get a bond today at 4.5%. Even after taxes, you're doing better by getting the bond than you are by paying down your mortgage rate. Right. And the higher the the lower the interest rate, the better the chances you're going to be able to earn more as an investment, which I think is really important. And we're getting to a place where you can now buy bonds that are four, five, and six percent. If you can buy those bonds and keep them for, I don't know, any number of years, two, five years, maybe longer, that really plays very nicely. That doesn't even count in or factor in what you could do if you also did a diversified investment into equities or into index mutual funds, right? You can do a bond fund, you can do a total stock market fund, others. Right now, the stock market is down, depending on the index you follow, 20 to 30%. So there's, you know, a great possibility that maybe not this year, but in the next couple of years, uh, putting cash into index mutual funds over the long run is going to beat the 3% or the 4% you're paying in your mortgage. And so, I, I wouldn't necessarily prepay that if you are paying an interest rate that's that low, simply because there's so much opportunity to do other investments. And yes, everything carries risk, prepaying your mortgage, preparing your debt, no risk. You guaranteed get that interest rate. But you know you have to think about the future as well, not just this year. Okay, so let's go to how people are doing in this. So it turns out that 85% of Americans have a mortgage rate less than 6% right now. About 60 something percent have an interest rate of less than 4%. You know, this is why nobody's refinancing at the moment, right? And why uh, sellers who have mortgages don't really wanna sell. Cause if you buy something, you're gonna end up taking out a mortgage unless you're paying cash, you're going to take out a mortgage that's much more expensive for probably less house than where you're living. So unless you have to move and you have to take out a mortgage, you're not. And that's one of the reasons why home sales have been declining for the last 10 months. So again, if you have a 3% loan, I think you're better paying off that just sort of slowly each month, taking your extra cash and investing it. If you own several properties, let's say you live in one and rent out the other, what should you do? Talk to your tax preparer because you don't necessarily want to pay off income property early because it may mess with how much you can deduct and what you're um, offsetting in terms of your revenue. And that can be a very significant financial benefit. So you're going to want to talk with your tax preparer, or if you do your own taxes and TurboTax, you can run the scenarios yourself, and it's probably worth doing. So let's talk about making some choices about where you actually spend your dollars, right? So your income, this is where the planning comes in. I talked about this at the beginning of the session. You really need to plan out what you're going to do, and then you need to put it into action. So here's your income at the top, and you divide that into, let's say, savings and expenses. And in savings, we've got emergency and short-term money. And we've got long-term and retirement money. And I, I break those apart because long-term might be 
you have a baby and you're planning for eight years in advance for that baby to go to college, or it might be something as simple uh, as um, in 10 years, I want to buy a house or I want to invest in something else. Retirement is retirement. On the expense side, we've got must have today and anything else that you can defer. And, you know, eventually some of the defer things are going to move into must have today's. But I think it's really helpful when you're doing your planning to separate out kind of what I call in my books, my real estate books, wants and needs. But for people, this must have today versus defer, maybe those are two good buckets that are meaning, meaningful to you. And the must have today is part of what we call our go to zero debt plan. And I, I put it up here so you can see that it's in the resources section. You can type in go to zero debt checklist and it'll give you an eight check eight point checklist on basically how to get started with my go to zero. And you can actually watch it on a video too. And we've got a lot of helpful pieces of content in the resources section on how to actually get your debt paid down and how to take you know back control of your payments and all that kind of stuff. But let's go back to this idea of must have today and can defer. So in your must have today list is probably food, but not takeout. Uh, and not restaurants and not, you know, maybe even whatever, clothing, but not just sort of like new outfits, whenever, whatever, whatever. It's it's basically like things you've outgrown, like shoes have worn out. You got to get new ones. Uh, shelter, got to live somewhere. Utilities, transportation to work, debt service, minimum amount owed versus prepaying your debt. Emergency account. I consider that to be a must have today. It just saves you so much hassle down the line. Uh, and then insurance, you know, homeowner or renters, health, uh, auto, life, basics that you absolutely need. What can you defer? Almost everything else. Entertainment, travel, eating out, subscriptions, theater, uh, prepaying your debt, even if you need to, you know, long-term or retirement savings and long-term care insurance, uh, pet insurance, other kinds of things. You know, if you're really in a tight place, you're, this is where it's must have today, everything else can be deferred. And you'll have to make those choices for yourself. I won't be able to help you with that, but you know, you'll be able to think it through. So as your debt declines, because you're taking all that extra cash and plowing it into paying off your debt, right? your spending and your savings is going to increase. And that's going to be, I think, a really positive momentum um, for yourself. But again, none of this will happen. I mean, you can, I'm going to go back to this, right? You can make the choices in your plan about where you want to spend your money and you can bring your whole family in on that conversation, which I, by the way, think is a great idea. Talk it through, engage them, ask for their help, put it into place, right? And then afterwards, you're going to, all of you, reap the benefits of this. It's not just a one and done. This is an ongoing way for you to share money and, and transfer, frankly, money lessons you're learning to the next generation, which is how you build generational wealth. Now, I wanted to end today by giving you some of my favorite money rules of thumb. And I also call them cliches to live and grow your money by because I'm sure you've heard some of these before. It's my take on them. It's things that I've done my whole life. And, you know, I think it allows you to live a very rich life, but to have a very comfortable future. And that really is, you know, what everybody's trying to do, right? Organize today, put some plan in plans into action, and then live better. So pay yourself first and last. Again, this is just, it's, it's cliche by this point, but have money taken out of your payroll. You can have HR direct some of your cash to go into separate accounts. Last, make sure that your 401k match is, is done. Uh, make sure you've got your emergency account built up. Everything should go first and last. So all the cash that's left, extra money to pay down your debt, extra money into your emergency fund, Make sure your 401k is getting at least the match. Uh, one of my favorite maxims, you're never going to get rich paying off debt. So if you've got credit card debt and that's how you're managing your life, you've got to really take a closer look at what you're doing. Because as long as you're paying off debt every month, 
you're just not going to get rich. And I really don't mean home home debt, right? You, you have to live somewhere. You're much better off having a home and staying in it. Um, but if you're getting a new car every two or three years and you're paying $50,000, $80,000 for that car, or you're leasing that kind of a car, you should take another look at it. Because unless you've got money to burn, that kind of debt isn't going to pay off for you in the long run. Uh, use credit cards for points and cash back, not because you can't afford to buy the thing, right? I mean, I think it goes without saying, again, you're not going to get rich paying off debt. And if you're using credit cards um, just because you can't afford to buy something, you know, it's just not a smart way to go. Um, if interest rates go up, you're going to want to pay down your debt faster, right? And I, I'm just going to say you're making more money than you think. Right now, you may feel like you're living paycheck to paycheck, but take another look at your spending. Think about what you need to have right now, what can be deferred. That whole deferred gratification thing is a great way to just say, can I wait a week? Can I wait a month? Can I wait a year to buy that? And I'm pretty sure you'll figure out that you can. Now, if interest rates are low and there's no other debt, just invest your spare cash. Because again, as we just discussed, you're much more likely to earn more on your money than you're paying for your debt service. So play that spread in a way that makes sense for you. Always remember, dollar cost averaging works. Every month, just plow you know, more money in on a regular basis, no matter where the stock market is. And in the long run, 20, 30, 40 years down the line, you're going to be super happy you did that. I also think it never pays to get fancy with your investments, right? You don't have to beat the pros to wind up rich. You don't have to beat the market to wind up rich. If you focus on the expense ratios so that more of what you invest goes towards the investment and not the fees, you're going to wind up in a terrific place. And I think a lot of times we want to get fancy with our investments. I think I think there's some psychic benefit to being able to go, hey, I invested in Tesla. Um, but if you invested in Tesla, you'd probably be pretty unhappy about that right now, unless you were smart enough to sell out. And that's the other thing that most people don't do. They just don't know when to sell. They, they get that boost, that adrenaline boost from holding on to a winning stock, and they never actually cash out. And so what's the plan, right? What is your investment plan? You got to come up with the plan and stick to it. And maybe later on this year, we'll do a whole thing on just investment planning. But my grandfather, for example, he had a plan and his plan was sell half when the stock doubles. Even if you love it, sell half when the stock doubles. He did that consistently and ended up leaving a very significant amount of money to my mother and my uncle. Just from a guy who never did very much, you know, he had a nice career, but nothing big, never finished college. Um, he just figured that if he was slow and steady with his investing, he would do well. And that's exactly what happened. Um, and so I think that you really have to have whatever plan that is. And again, put it into action. If my grandfather just said, sell half when it doubles and never did that, uh, he would have failed. And, and not have made money in his investments. So you've got to do both. And then index mutual funds rule, folks. I, I have said this for years. We talk about it in the platform. There's lots of information on it. When you do managed mutual funds, you are paying a very high price for some fancy person, usually a guy, to uh, pick hand pick these. But you know what? Index mutual funds beat managed mutual funds 85% of the time, 85%. And if it's 85% of the time, how do you know that of the 12,000 funds out there, I don't know how many there are, there are a lot, that, that you're actually finding the 15% that are going to beat it. And by the way, that changes every year. So it's not like you can stick with it and then they continue to do well. Even hedge funds don't do well. Um, so index mutual funds are the easy and inexpensive way for you to stay attuned to the market. And remember, you know, go back up to, um, you know, number seven here. You don't have to get fancy. You don't have to beat the market to wind up rich, right? And everybody's definition of rich is different anyway. So, you know, stick with index mutual funds. I used to own 
I am not joking. This is not hyperbole. I had more than 60 individual companies I'd invested in at one point in time in my investing career. And one day I went to visit with my mom's um, registered investment advisor. And he said, what are you investing in these days? And I said, oh, well, look what I've got. And I showed him this and he looked at me and he said, are you insane? Are you reading all the K-1s for those? Are you doing the work you need to do? And of course I was not. And he's like, get rid of it. 10 or less is all you should be doing. And then I realized with an index mutual fund, I would actually be able to fully diversify without having to worry that I was trying to beat every beat the market. So, you know, an index mutual fund that's maybe stock based, US based, international based, a, a, you know, one that's bonds, that's pretty much all the diversity that you're going to need for your investments. So, Index mutual funds, cheap to own, meets the market that they're based on. Um, and you just want to make sure you're getting the, the cheapest one that you can out there. And then finally, slow and steady wins the race, right? At the end of the day, whatever it is you're doing, don't make fast decisions. It almost work, always works out badly. You know, if you suffer a divorce or a loss or an illness, don't make a big money decision right on top of all that. You need some time to regain your equilibrium, to sit and really think about what you want to do next, where you're going to go. And the same is true if something wonderful happens to you. If you win the lottery, not the really big lottery, but let's say you won a million dollars or half a million dollars in the lottery, please don't go out and buy a Lamborghini the next day. I know you feel like you're going to want to do that, but instead, just see if you can rent one for a week. It, it's, you know, this idea that we have to go and spend every dollar we make. It's so ingrained in the American culture, but really uh, what you wanna do is take a step back, take a deep breath, do a little meditation, focus on the big picture of where you wanna go and be very thoughtful and careful about your next move. And again, go back to your plan, put the plan in place, act on it, um, and then make your decisions. All right, I'm going to stop talking for a moment. I'm going to give you a chance to ask some questions. Um, if there are any, please feel free to put them in either the chat box or the Q&A box. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions uh, at all. I always treat this as like an AMA. You can ask me anything. And if we don't know, we can always go and get the questions for you or feel free to ask about this particular topic. I'm happy to do that as well. So are there, if there are any questions, again, you want to put them in the chat box or you want to, um, you know, raise your hand, put them in a QA, and a and we're happy to take those questions if you have them. And while you're doing that, I'm going to move to this next slide and show you that our next Love and Money uh, series webinar will take place on February 16th at 1 p.m. I hope you can join us. We are going to talk about uh, conversations that you're going to want to have. Um, how? What are the 10 things that you need to talk to your spouse or, or partner or most loved one about and how to make those um, really positive conversations? I think they're very difficult to have. Uh, and I think that you're going to want to have them though, especially now uh, as we're coming off this pandemic. And by the way, can I just say, I can't believe we're basically three years this pandemic's been going on. So very much looking forward to the end of that. All right. Well, if there are no questions, thank you so much for participating and being here today. You can always find us at the bottom. Just hit customer service at bestmoneymoves.com. If you've got a topic or something you want to say, we're more than happy to get back to you. Or if you're having an issue relating to uh, money, please reach out and let us know. All right. Thanks so much, everybody. Hope you have a great rest of your day.